Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Pablo. I'm one of the founders and the CTO at Octeto. Octeto is a development platform to deploy remote development environments on Kubernetes. And we will talk about that a little bit uh, later. And hi, I'm Vinay. I work for FutureWay Technologies. It's the research arm of our parent company, Huawei. And I've been working on Kubernetes. My interests are in Kubernetes network and compute and lately eBPF. And uh, we hope to have a good talk with you today. Thank you. Cool. So this is the agenda of the talk. Um, we are going to introduce the idea of cloud-native development environments, uh, the problems that they solve, and also some of their challenges. Uh, one of them is to make them uh, cost-effective. Um, so we will analyze the different challenges there, and then we will introduce a feature coming soon. It's in place pot resize. And the idea with this feature is that you can modify the request and the limits of a running pod without restarting the pod. Uh, after that, we will see a demo using in place pod resize and eBPF to optimize the infrastructure uh, utiliz utilization of uh, cloud native development environments. And we will finalize with some takeaways. OK, so let's talk about cloud native development environments. And first, Let's see the current state of the art. So most companies are moving to Kubernetes and microservices for the right reason. Sorry. OK. Uh, so most companies are moving to Kubernetes and microservices for the right reasons, right? They solve many problems in production environments, but they also come with some challenges. And one of them is that they make, make it harder to mimic your production environment in your local dev environment. Um, even with tools like Docker, uh, local Kubernetes distributions like Minikube, uh, you need to install this software, run all these microservices. So there are several issues there. One of them is that you make run out of CPU and memory in your laptop, so things go very slow or even stop working. Um, you need to maintain local configuration, so if there is something wrong in your dev environment, it's very difficult to replicate um, the same problem in other laptop, or it's very hard for anyone else to troubleshoot what is the issue. And if you are using, for example, multi-repo, uh, it's not trivial to orchestrate the build, push, and deploy of all these containers running locally. So what most people do is to assume an environment disparity between dev environments and production. And I think this is wrong. Um, because at the end, what you are doing is shifting right your testing efforts. Ideally, a developer should be able to deploy a dev environment and test end-to-end -end all the changes that they are doing before even sending a pull request. But um, if you are not able to do that, you need to send a PR, wait for the continuous integration job to validate your changes, or even worse, you need to merge and wait for an staging or integration environment to be accredited, and then do the final end-to-end -end test there. And if there is an issue, you need to start again, um, work on your local dev environment, send a PR, and all those things. So all this cycle reduces the developer productivity a lot and also the developer happiness. So the solution that we propose um, is cloud-native development environments. And this is a high-level view of this methodology. The idea is to have a single Kubernetes cluster served by all the developers. And every developer is working on a different namespace. And you can have as much isolation you need between namespaces using the standard Kubernetes um, objects. Um, so the idea is that on each namespace, the developer is able to deploy a full replica of the application, which is much more realistic because this is running in Kubernetes with your Helm charts, um, using your network configuration, security policies, the same thing that you do in production. Um, and it's fully replicable because it doesn't depend on your local configuration. Um, you should be able to deploy any commit from any Git repository, and everything happens in the cluster, in the cloud, so it doesn't depend on your 
local configuration, and anyone in your team can go there and check it out because it's available for everyone. Um, so in order to um, adopt this methodology, it's very important that for the developer, the dev experience is the same. And to do that, there are several open source projects like Octeto, Telepresence, Teal, Garden, and many more. And more or less, the goal of these uh, dev tools is to provide this experience. So the developer keeps working locally on their IDE, and the application is hot reloading on remote immediately. And you can even set, uh, configure your debugger, set breakpoints, and all those things. So that's key for developer adoption. Uh, if you need to change the developer workflow, um, people is, are not going to adopt it. But um, with these tools, you can have a realistic, replicable, and, and, and fast iteration uh, remote dev environments. So that's the solution, and I'm going to talk about one of the problems with this approach, and is that you need to run all these environments in the cloud, and it could be an impact in your cloud build, right, which is scary. Um, but good news is that Kubernetes is very good to optimize resource allocation. That means that all the containers running in the same um, node, they may share the CPU and the memory available in the node. So for example, if you are building your application and you need a spike for CPU and memory, the memory and the CPU of the node is available for your container, and when you are done, the same CPU and memory is available for other containers. So that is uh, very helpful to optimize your infra uh, utilization. And also, if you need more nodes in your cluster, the cluster will auto-scale up and down as needed automatically. So that's good news, but let's analyze different use cases for development environments to see if this is really helpful in our use case. So this is a workload in production, and it's more or less using two CPUs all the time. So we are able to set the CPU request to two CPUs. And in this case, it's working very good. Uh, if there are more incoming requests, the deployment will scale horizontally, so that's good. But for development, it's a little bit different. What usually happens is that the, when the application is booting, you need more CPU and memory to, boot your, to bootstrap your, your application. And then after a while, in development, you don't usually have that many incoming requests, right? So after a while, you need less CPU and memory to keep your application running. Um, so in this case, there is already uh, the vertical pod autoscaler in the Kubernetes uh, community. And the idea is that the vertical pod autoscaler monitors your container CPU and memory usage, and then it will update the requests and limits of your containers based on the real usage of your container. Here I'm assuming that in place pod resize is available because otherwise here, when the requests are updated, the container will restart and then you would have the booting time, uh, booting uh, CPU again. But let's assume that in place pod resize is available. But even with that, when you are developing, there are random spikes and they tend to be short in time. For example, you are working on your application, editing your code, you don't need too much CPU to do that. But then you need to build your application with, for example, a make command. So for the make command, you need more CPU. Uh, but the vertical pod autoscaler is reactive, so there is a delay between you start using more CPU and until the, BP, the vertical pod autoscaler updates the, the request of the pod. So in this case, um, I don't have in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, enough uh, requests here to run my main command. Then the requests are updated, but I'm not using this CPU here. Then the vertical output, uh, pod autoscaler updates the request again, and I don't have two CPUs available for the main command. So there is a delay, so it's, it's not really working for, for this scenario. Ideally, we would like something like this, something that is proactive and updates the CPU request of my container in real time, basically, or milliseconds. So in our case, when we started Octeto, we basically ran a dedicated cluster for um, every customer. 
And when we started Octeto, we were using a standard Kubernetes request and limits. And um, using that, we were able to run eight pods per node, um, which is not cool because um, we are using uh, uh, VMs with four CPUs and 32 gigas of memory, and we were not utilizing all the resources. So what we did is an ad hoc solution for this. It's a custom scheduler, basically. And with that solution, with I don't have time to talk about, but with that solution, we were able to run 80 ports per node without affecting the developer experience. So this is huge. It's 10x infra savings. And, and there is a lot of potential to solve this problem properly. Our ad hoc solution is not ideal. Uh, it requires a lot of effort to maintain the solution and to configure the solution for different customers. Uh, but it shows us the potential of solving this problem. So the question is if there is a better way to solve this. And with that in mind, I'm going to pass to Vinay to talk about in place for resize and eBPF. Thank you, Pablo. That was great. So in place pod resize, um, can I get a show of hands? How many people here are aware that this feature is in the works? A few? OK. Then those of you probably know that this PR is moving at light speeds. <laughs> OK. Well, not exactly light speeds. We're being extra cautious. And there are good reasons for that. The PR is big. And it touches critical components in Kubernetes. And mistakes can be costly. So it's Im imperative that we stage it in, in a responsible way. What really matters is that we get across that finish line, hopefully in 126. I don't know. We just released the container D169, which is needed for this. And so this PR could merge any day now in the next few years. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are really nice to me, I will leave this PR to you in my will. <laughs> OK, enough grief for my PR. So let's take a look at what really changed. The first thing we did was we made you have the container spec in that there's the resources field. We made it mutable for CPU and memory. When you do that, what it lets you do is it lets you update, send a patch to your pod spec saying, I want the container. I started out with one CPU, but I want two. Thus, you're expressing desired resources for the pod. And then Kubernetes goes to work doing what it does best, which is you know get the actual state equal to the desired state. So with that, with the ability to specify a desired state of resources, we need a, a way to signal the user who's specified the request what's the status of the request. And for that, we introduced a new field called resize in the pod status. This status holds one of these four values when you have a pending request for resize. The interesting one is in progress, where, which should be the default case. That means that the kubelet was able to allocate the memory or CPU that you wanted, and it's working on it with the runtime to make it happen. Proposed as the initial state where you, when your API server looks at your request, it makes sure that the request is valid, you're not exceeding, like your requests are not exceeding limits and stuff like that. And uh, infeasible is, the user may not know, okay, there, there is a node that has four CPUs, they may ask, okay, my pod needs five. It's never gonna happen. So that's a signal that you may need to evict your pod and ask the scheduler to schedule a new instance to another node where you can get five CPUs. And deferred is a case where the node has six CPUs, but another pod is using two CPUs there. And it's possible, but just not now. It's your choice. Do you want to wait, or do you want to evict and get five CPUs elsewhere? We added a couple of more fields. The resources allocated field in the container status, uh, it's a persistent way of telling what is it that the in-progress the in pod status is driving towards. And the resources field in the container status, I know there are a lot of these fields in here, but the resources field in the container status uh, tells you the actual state as reported to us by the runtime. So that's what is actually on the container, on your containers. Lastly, we have a new field called resize policy. This was introduced for one reason. There are some legacy applications where, like Java applications, which are using the XMX flag, they're not able to take advantage of uh, increased capacity of the pod without restarting. It's just the, those applications need them. So you have we want to give the users a way to specify, hey, this is, uh, my application needs to be restarted. The default is restart not required, where we'll try to, we will try to resize your pod without restarting. It doesn't guarantee, it's not a guarantee, but Kubernetes will try its best. 
So what does it really involve? I touched upon this earlier. We have changes to the API server, kubelet, scheduler, and runtime. There is a lot to go into here, uh, but I will focus on one thing, uh, the kubelet. So kubelet admission of a resized request uh, is interesting here because this PR introduces a new race condition where the resized request is racing with a pod that may just have been scheduled to that node. And Kubelet is the ultimate authority, and it will, uh, it's a gatekeeper. It checks to make sure that at any point of time, the requested resources is not exceeding what's available. So one of the two requests might fail if there is a contention. Going to, one of the best ways to really look at how this works is to go through it step by step. So let's do that now. Consider this example here. What we have here is a node where you have a pod with 40 milli CPUs allocated to it. Now, you desire to give it 80 milli CPUs, so it starts with a patch to the pod spec. The API server validates this pod spec, uh, the patch, and then updates the object store. In this case, we update the CD. Now, the next step is watch is triggered for the scheduler and kubelet. The scheduler takes that, looks at that watch and updates its pod cache and uses that to do the do the max of desired and actual so that it doesn't compete with the resize that's going that's in progress. And in this case, let's assume that the kubelet was able to successfully allocate the, the resources that was requested, 80 milli CPUs. So it does the admit pod resize, it succeeds, and it immediately patches the pod status with the pod status resize field, saying, I was able to give you 80 milli CPUs, and the pro the status of your resize is in progress, and I'm gonna be working with the runtime to make it happen. Now, in this case, we are increasing the CPU, so the pod C group, C C group settings are, initial, are set first, and then it goes and talks to container D, the runtime, via the update container resources, CRI API, asking container D to allocate 80 milli CPUs for the pods containers. And now, the container D goes to work, it updates the configuration for the pod, and next time a container status CRI API comes in, it reports back to the kubelet saying, yes, your pod, its containers have 80 milli CPUs. That triggers a generation of an update, status update to the pod, where it patches the pod status saying, the resize is now complete, the pod has 80 milli CPUs, and we have come full circle. So that is the happy golden path. Now, one, there is a nuance to this that I want to touch upon. Your pod may have more than one container, and you may be resizing more than one container at the same time. You may be giving more resources to some and taking, more resu taking resources away from other containers. In all these cases, what we do is we order the resize such that the decreases for container resize are done before the increases are invoked. And if there is a net increase to the pod C group values, due to the resize, then the pod C groups are ordered first, and then the containers are resized, and vice versa. Why is this important? Let's take the scenario. You have a system where you have two gig of memory available to the pods, and you have one single pod running on that system. Uh, it has two containers, They're, they take one gig each, and we desire to give C1 1.5 gig, and cut memory for C2, make it 0.5 gig. Now, the pod, hasn't changed, the pod's resources are the same. But if we did C1 and then C2, we are oversubscribed and this request will fail. And the pod will end up in a bad state. It's for this reason that we want the runtimes to not only support update container resources CRI API, but do so in a synchronous and transactional manner. If we don't do this, then the down, downstream request to update the pod C groups might fail and the pod will be in a bad state. And when I say synchronous and transactional, what I mean here is that don't queue a task and say, okay, I will apply this later. We need that uh, yay or nay, whether it succeeded or it failed, and if it failed, what's the reason for failure in the context of that update container resources CRI API call. Uh, one other thing that got introduced to the, to the container status CRI API is a resources field. This is what allows the container runtime to tell us, to tell kubelet, what resources are actually configured on the pod. I guess you're starting to see why this feature is a little complex, right? <laughs> and lastly, 
there is C group V2. It's here. Uh, new, more and more OSs are shifting to C group V2. There are a bunch of desirable features to this. For us, in particular, we're interested in the ability to specify memory requests at the container level. We did not have that in C group V1. There is another talk, I believe it's on Friday, it's by David Porter and Runal Patel uh, about C group V2. I highly recommend attending that if you can. Okay, so this is the fun stuff. We, what can we do with eBPF for in-place pod resize? As Pablo has laid out, we have a problem here. We have uh, the use case here with the remote dev environments. There is this workload where there are spikes and the reactive approach that we have with VPA is not good enough. So how do we, how can eBPF help? Let's take a look. Consider this pod here. It's called kubebuild pod with one container, kubebuild container. And as you might guess, we use this pod to exec into the pod and edit code and build code. It's a pretty good example that mimics the remote dev environment, except that in the remote dev you might do rsync of local code to remote. What's interesting here is that when we look at the requests, the resources that we have requested, we're requesting four CPUs, which is good enough to you know, edit code and build, but we have curated and cherry-picked a value of 50 meg for memory. That is sufficient to edit code and edit code with a lightweight editor like VI, but not enough to build. If you try to hit the make command with this much of memory, the oom killer will come along and take care of things. It's gonna kill your process, or it's gonna run really slow. So, well, what can eBPF do? Well, let's take a look. What you're looking at here is this 20 odd lines of Python code. That's all we need, that's it. You go to the node on which the pod is running and tell Python, hey, run this for me, and you're set. Looking more closely, there are two parts to it. The first is the eBPF code itself. This code attaches to the exec, exec VE system call that's the system call through which all the commands in the system that are executed go through. You do ls, it goes through exec. You do make, it goes through ls. It goes through exec. <laughs> and the second part is, well, when this, when this uh, eBPF program sees those commands, it traces it. It traces it to a trace file. And the second part of this is that we watch the trace file, and if we see make in the trace file, then we resize our pod to five gig. That's it. It's very simple, isn't it? Well, not so much. This, the only good thing about this code is that it fits on one PowerPoint slide. It's, <laughs> it's very inefficient. Everything that you're doing in the system is getting traced to a trace file. I actually tried it, it's really slow. And it's of limited use. So you're in your container, you're happily writing code, somebody else doesn't make another container and you resize, that's not great, right? <laughs> so let's do something a little less dumb for the demo. So BPF also offers this facility of maps, which is a way for uh, talking to the eBPF program and having it be more configurable than this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use the BPF maps to tell the eBPF program to focus on only specific containers and in that container, focus on specific commands. How do we do that? The containers have C group ID, so we specify the C group ID as a key in the, BBP, in the eBPF maps and in the value, we specify the list of commands that we're interested in tracing. This will let us only trace the commands from the containers that we are interested in. That's good, but how does the user tell this to us? Well, we resort to the good old annotations. We've defined an annotation called eBPF resize, which contains C name, the container name that we're interested in, and the commands that we're interested in, in this case, make, and of course, what do you want to resize to? So we specify these three things. With these three things, the pod watcher thread or process can configure the BPF maps and the program can trace exactly what we need. With that, all we need to do is initiate the resize when we see the trace. And of course, we are lazy Kubernetes people. We are not gonna go to each node and say, hey, Python, run this code, hey, Python, run this code. We're gonna ask Kubernetes to do it. We hand it a daemon set and Kubernetes does the hard work for us. I have code uh, up on GitHub, uh, it's demo code only, so don't run it in production. <laughs> so uh, you can take a look at it and see how this works, it's a prototype. 
And well, it brings us to the show time. Okay, I'm gonna switch to the, the screen here and this. Can everyone see the, the terminal screens okay all the way in the back? This is the hardest part to get, okay, great. Okay, what you're looking at here is, uh, is a local, all these terminals are SSH into a local VM called eBPF resize. And uh, we're running a local Kubernetes cluster, a local cluster here with in-place pod resize feature gate enabled. That means we can resize our pods without restarting the pod or containers. The first step is to, of course, deploy the build pod. And I'm doing that here with this YAML deployed. It's gonna take a moment, there it is. So we have the pod running here, the kube build pod. We can exec into this pod, edit code and build code. And we have this, uh, Window up here shows the stats. It's using it's using 600 600 KB. It's using under one MB, MB of memory, and then you have we can do one more thing here. We get the kube build pod in JSON format and query the status resources allocated the new field that we introduced for this feature that tells us what the kubelet has allocated for your pods pod and its containers. In this case, we are focusing on the build container. That's container zero. Now let's take a look at, let's edit some code. So I'm gonna exec into the build pod and ls. This is the Kubernetes 125 release branch that I've gotten the pod for this demo. Get status shows us that. If you're looking at the memory values, we are at 42 meg. It's under what we, so we have 50, we're under that. And we use a lightweight editor like Vim and edit some code. So this does not look right. Kubernetes, also known as Kates, we need to fix this. So let's fix it. All right. That looks much better, isn't it? Okay. So the memory usage is 30 meg, we're good. So what happens when you try to build this? Let's try. There's one way to find out. So it's gonna run really, oh, so it got killed. Well, that was fast. This is expected, right? We have 50 meg and make is trying to allocate more than 50 and we just don't have it. And the uh, ohm killer came along, came along and pretty much told us to go kick rocks. So what can we do? We have choices, we have options. We can use, we can schedule the pod with five gig and you won't have to worry about it. Of course, your bank account won't be happy and you could use, you could rely on VPA. When VPA sees these OOM events, out of memory events, it will resize the pod for you, but it's not great developer experience. So there is another way, fortunately. Let's take a look at what eBPF can do for us. VPF tool map list just shows that map entries. I'm gonna use this later, but first is to deploy the daemon set. So with this command, I'm gonna deploy the daemon set. It's gonna show up here. It takes a moment to initialize, now it's running. We can know that the program is up and running by looking using the BPF tool to list the map entries. So I'm gonna run that again. So there is a map entry here now. We can get into the details of this by doing a dump of this map entry. 67. So what we see here is a key 14752. That is the C group ID of this container in which I just executed the make command, which you know got killed by Ohm killer. And it's telling the BPF program, hey, if you see this container execute a make command, then please trace it. So now let's try this again. Let's see if it works. Oh, please keep an eye on this window the top left, top right corner window with the 50 meg value uh, that's being watched as I hit the make command. Here we go. So we're at five gig and the container seems to be happy. It's as you allocating whatever it needs and the make is making much better progress than it did before. So that my friends is the magic of eBPF for you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let me take a moment to thank the demo gods here for sa saving the surprises for another day. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, so what did, we, what did we see today? We saw that uh, we have this use case, uh, as Pablo described, where make spikes that happen in the development environment, they need a much more responsive resize, and that's not always possible with, the, what, with what we currently have. And we saw that eBPF programs can help here by almost instantaneously resizing the pod for you to your needs. And uh, so to recap, we feel that cloud native development environments are the future and because they're cost effective, they're, uh, they give you a production like environment and all teams work on the same config which uh, saves on testing costs and uh, production issues. We, we want the runtimes to be able to support uh, in-place resize. If you're working with runtime or if you're a maintainer, please consider adding support for in-place resize to your runtime. We don't want the user to have to worry about whether, whether this works with my runtime or not. Uh, we want it to just work. It shouldn't be even be something that people think about. That's where we want to be. And uh, try this feature gate out. When this makes it in, please turn on the feature gate, hammer on it, beat up on the feature. We want to find those corner case issues. It's important to find, it's important to handle the use case as well, but it's also important to ha gracefully handle the abuse cases. And lastly, try out eBPF. Look, I'm, I'm no eBPF expert, not even close, but we managed to cobble together this little improvement in a short time. And this improvement got us from being reactive to being proactive for this use case. It took us from you know, tens or hundreds of seconds of response time to like a sub-second response time. And that little improvement is actually a paradigm shift now. And it's great when small improvements lead to amplified gains. So yeah, try out eBPF. It just might solve problems for you. We have one more slide to go. And it's the one that everyone is waiting for. The title says it all, right? So please scan this QR code. It will take you to a place where you can leave, you can leave feedback for us. And please tell us what you found useful. And more importantly, what we could do better. And uh, we love to hear from you. We love the feedback. So, and thank you for being here. Thank you for being such a great audience. Uh, it's been a pleasure. With that, I will conclude this talk. Thank you.